I worked for almost 30 years as a development practitioner in the United Nations in many countries across the world. Many development problems were rooted and connected to public health problems. And the health problems could not be fixed just by the health sector. And one of the themes of my career was to try to bring public health into the mainstream development realm, try to make those connections and when I then went from working for the UN to working for a philanthropy that made grants to civil society organizations in Europe and the United States, again, I saw that connection between health problems of people and their broader economic and social problems was not being made. And that I felt a personal responsibility to make those connections. And I try to stress that in my teaching because that's one of the reasons it was so important to me when I retired from the United Nations and from philanthropy to spend the next set of years helping to shape and build a generation of public health leaders that will understand that unless you look at these problems holistically, we'll never make progress on them. That was today's guest, Dr. Kathleen Corvero. Hello and welcome everybody to Making Public Health Personal. This podcast is brought to you by the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy in New York City. I'm your host, Laura Mioli Farragon. Thanks for listening. Today's episode of Making Public Health Personal is about preventing violence against children. This is a very sensitive topic, maybe not something we're all comfortable talking about, but you can't solve this problem without having the difficult conversations. Today's guest is Dr. Kathleen Crovero, Distinguished Lecturer in the Health Policy and Management Department here at CUNY SPH. She is also the co-director of the Center for Immigrant, Refugee, and Global Health. Dr. Crovero spent 25 years working for the United Nations, including a key role at UNICEF, and she dedicates her career to ending violence against women and children. We'll discuss this public health issue, which is unfortunately very common on a global scale and has serious long-term effects. Dr. Corvero will share findings from the Violence Against Children and Youth surveys that were collected over 10 years in 24 countries. This includes who is most affected, where they live, and how government officials can decide which of the seven evidence-based implementations to reduce violence against children should be implemented. No matter what your sphere of influence is, this episode will provide resources to become part of the solution. Thanks for joining me today, Kathleen. Great to be here. It seems very straightforward, but how would you define violence against children? What is included in that? That's a good question. The definitions of violence against children vary across countries and regions, but it includes sexual violence, physical violence, and psychological and emotional violence. So it would include maltreatment, bullying, youth violence, intimate partner violence, various forms of sexual violence, including incest or sexual violence that happens in other situations. And then emotional or psychological violence is the act of robbing um, children of their dignity um, or self-confidence in order to succeed either at school or at home, um, et cetera. So there's varying definitions of it, but it would include, for example, corporal punishment, either at school or at home. So some of the things we normally think of as violence, but there are unfortunately many ways that we don't always think about that are causing great harm to children globally. So why is this a public health problem? You know, it's a public health problem because of the great impacts that it has on children. Um, it causes severe injury. It can cause impaired brain and nervous system development, negative coping and uh, health behaviors later on. So children that are victims of violence are very often children that engage in risky behaviors, risky health behaviors later on in life. They are much more likely to um, become addicted to different substances. There's unintended pregnancies that come from sexual violence. There's mental health issues, depression, eating disorders, self-harm, non-communicable diseases because the lack of self-confidence causes older adults who have experienced violence as children 
uh, not to take care of themselves. So it causes an enormous number of visible and sometimes invisible health problems. And too often in the United States and in other countries, health personnel don't feel that it's their role to point this out or to identify violence. They feel this is somehow the work of the social system. So it's often doctors, nurses, clinicians of various types that could see violence or suspected the bruises of suspected violence uh, much earlier than other professionals. And we're not seeing it systematically being picked up or prioritized. So it sounds like there's a lot of long-term effects, both mental and physical, violence against children and children who witness violence both have long-term effects. Which would you say is is worse? I mean, they're both terrible, obviously. It's hard to say which is worse. We see that very similar effects among children who witness violence as children who actually experience violence. Furthermore, in both cases, children who experience violence directly or who witness it are unfortunately much more likely to be perpetrators of violence as they get older. So you might that might be counterintuitive and you ask, well, if they see how horrible it is, how do they become perpetrators? Because it's normalized, because that's what they know, because that's what they see. They are witnessing intimate partner violence in their formative years, then that's what a relationship between a man and a woman is. So it's extremely important also to stop the witnessing of violence Mm -hmm. as much as it is the actual experience of it. And you worked for the United Nations, UNICEF, and other nonprofits with some pretty far-reaching influence. How is violence against children a public health problem, both locally and globally? It's a public health problem because of the profound consequences um, on children as a result of violence. So we're going to find both in the United States, but certainly in um, low-income countries and in other countries of the world, children who experience violence are um, much more likely to end up in the emergency room with injuries, and they're more likely to miss school. They're more likely to have unhealthy behaviors later on that will cause them to have long-lasting problems. Obesity, for instance, would be, you know, sometimes children will find um, protection or comfort in various ways that's not necessarily healthy for them. Both obesity, but equally important eating disorders. Just a there's a, a self-loathing that develops if you're a victim of violence, both children and adults, that can uh, result in very unhealthy behaviors. And you mentioned that the world is becoming more dangerous in terms of wars, online danger, trafficking. Yeah, you know, I think there's been um, a lot of progress in dealing with this problem over the last 20 years, a greater willingness to talk about it. Um, We have the Violence Against Children and Youth Surveys, which provide concrete data about where, when, and to whom this violence is happening. So it's harder to deny and it's easier to act upon. So there's been some violence on that front, but unfortunately, Other factors are outstripping the progress. So digital online violence is relatively new, um, but it's a huge source of exploitation, sexual in particular, exploitation of children now. Um, And we don't even, we really haven't developed, or we need to further develop ways to protect children from this and at the same time allow them to enjoy the benefits that the internet and digital learning, et cetera, offers them. So what is being done in different countries and as United Nations to solve this problem? Things are happening at various levels. You have um, the global work and then some of the country level work and they're connected. So let me take three examples. One is a report called Out of the Shadows, which is being done by the Economist Intelligence Unit in conjunction with a number of civil society organizations and UNICEF. Um, And it actually ranks countries in the kinds of protections and policies they have in place to prevent 
sexual violence against children. So that comes out as a scorecard where all countries can see how they measure up against others uh, in terms of having the right protections in place for their children. So that's a way that you raise awareness of it. Um, there's also something called the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, which has over 200 UN agencies, civil society organizations, government members that share information and program learning around ending violence against children. And then that gets amplified uh, globally. And there's a very new initiative called the Brave Movement. It's a movement of activist survivors, so adult survivors of childhood sexual violence. So people who are adults now, but who experienced sexual violence as children, they have come together, they're building allies, and they're objective is to fundamentally shift the blame from the victim to the perpetrators and to the societies that fail those victims in terms of protection. So there are a number of ways this is being tackled, but it's a huge problem. And we really need to make sure that the global advocacy and the global action gets translated into concrete change for children on the ground. And tell me about your involvement with the Inspire Package. The Inspire Package is a set of seven evidence-based strategies that will prevent and end violence against children, all forms of violence at national level. Now, it's important for a couple of reasons. One is that a big problem we've had is that this whole idea of violence against children, well, people have perpetrated violence against children since time immemorial. There's really nothing you can do about it. Or it's a low income problem. It only happens in a uh, developing country, you know, countries in low income countries. Or in the United States, it only happens in low income families. It's a cultural problem. So people have tried to say that there are certain parts of the world where um, it's more acceptable than in other parts of the world to perpetrate violence against children. It's complicated and it's somebody else's problem. And overriding these is this idea of fatalism, that there's really nothing you can do. So the Inspire Package sets out seven evidence-based mm -hmm. strategies that actually work to prevent violence against children and to end the violence that is occurring. The second reason Inspire is extremely important is that before this, the big agencies working to end violence against children, including UNICEF, uh, the World Health Organization, Save the Children, they were all advocating slightly different things, like slightly different ways forward, which was fueling the idea that, well, if WHO and UNICEF can't even agree on what can end violence against children, Obviously, it's not possible to do it. So let's move on to a problem that's actually preventable. So Inspire brought together the 10 biggest organizations working on preventing and ending violence against children. And they agreed on these seven evidence-based strategies. So there's no confusion anymore. There's no mixed messages Every government in the world is being told these are the seven things that will work to prevent and end violence against children. And they include implementing and enforcing the laws that are already on the books, because in many countries, there are very strong laws about uh, perpetrating violence against children, but they're just largely ignored, um, either deliberately or just because a country cannot enforce those laws. Second, you have to change norms and values. Too often, children are seen as the property of a family, mm -hmm. or, you know, it's a private affair, what you do with your own children. And that needs to change because children are a societal resource. Your children are my future leaders or they're my future problems. So children are not just private and belong to a certain family. They belong to the society and um, mm -hmm. the norms and values have to reflect that. Safe environments. So bus stops and playgrounds and other areas need to be well lit. They need to be in places that children can feel safe. They need to be well supervised. So the idea of creating safe environments, supporting parents and caregivers. And 
this is in normal times, but even particularly in times of conflict, economic hardship, or pandemics. We saw that during COVID, for example, um, the rates of parental violence against their children increased, and the rates of sexual exploitation on the internet increased. Why was that? Because of frustration, because kids were on uh, internet all day, and everyone was scared, and it just resulted in more violence against children. So parents need support, especially in the hard times. Income and economic strengthening. I want to be very clear that violence against children is a universal problem. It happens in the richest families and it happens in the poorest families. It happens in the richest countries and it happens in the poorest countries. But there is ample evidence that economic stress, and that's all relative depending on where you were to begin with, but economic Mm -hmm. stress increases frustration and can increase violence against children. Mm -hmm. The sixth one is response and support services. So when it happens, children need to have safe places and safe people to whom they can go and report violence, and then education and life skills. Both children need to learn what is appropriate or not appropriate. Um, in terms of people touching their bodies or their relationships with others. So these seven evidence-based strategies are changing the game in terms of what happens at national level. And how does that last one get implemented in the United States when the curriculum for children in public schools is varying based on different localities? It's a problem and it's a threat to making progress on ending violence against children. Um, and there are very there are many age appropriate, safe, innovative programs to help children as young as three or four know what's appropriate or not in terms of other people touching them. Um, and that's an extremely important knowledge for young kids to have. Um, there's lots of good programs for pre-adolescence about how do you treat other people? What's appropriate to do or not? What does it mean when somebody says, no, stop, I don't want you to do this? And the importance of respecting that. In some situations, these programs are going to fall prey to kind of the polarization and misinformation Mm -hmm. um, that other things have, but hopefully not, because these have proven to be extremely effective, not only in the United States, but in countries in Africa and Asia, South Asia. These are extremely important programs for children. Well, hopefully they will be standardized here in the U.S. education system. If you dream of making a difference in the world, a public health degree or certificate can give you the tools to do just that. The City University of New York's Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy equips public health professionals to advance not only a healthier New York City, but a healthier world for us all. We want you to join us in our mission. Visit sph.cuny.edu to learn more about our programs. No matter where you are in your career, CUNY SPH offers a broad range of degree and certificate programs to not only help you advance in your career, but to have a real impact on the world. Public health professionals are needed now more than ever. Join us. Visit sph.cuny.edu to learn more. You were also involved with creating and assessing violence against children and youth surveys. Tell us a bit about that and what you learned from this data. Okay. These violence uh, against children and youth surveys evolved because of one of the problems I mentioned earlier, which is, well, we can't really do anything about preventing violence against children because it happens everywhere. Um, We can't really see it. It's invisible. So therefore, there's very little that can be done about it. These violence against children and youth surveys, they actually are based on interviews with people between 13 and 24 asking them about the violence that they have are either currently experiencing or have experienced in, in the past. There's a very careful methodology. People are very well trained to do these surveys. But again, it busts the myth that we can't know where this violence occurs. Because violence against children surveys tell us very specifically in any given situation, they're done on the national level. So for instance, there was a 
a survey done in Uganda. Um, there was a survey done in Tanzania, in a, a number of other countries. And as a result of that, there's detailed information on what are the most dangerous places for children uh, in terms of violence? Who's perpetuating the violence? Is it boys or is it girls that it's happening to? It's unprecedented levels and depth of information. And on the basis of that, national plans of action for children are developed that address these specifics. So it's not that countries are told, well, take the seven inspire strategies and try to uh, implement them everywhere in every country. No, the Violence Against Children and Youth Survey will tell you, well, to what extent are parents the problem? Or to what extent is the violence happening in schools? And if it's happening in schools, is it happening to girls or is it happening to boys? Um, so it's very specific information on the basis of which action plans that work can be developed. And did you notice any differences between data among different countries? There are very specific um, differences. For instance, in the United States, we haven't done a violence against children in youth survey in the United States, but um, it would be good if we could do them. Most of them were done in Africa, and that's because of the problem I indicated before that we would like to, in the United States and in Europe, we like to see this as a problem that happens in the low-income countries. But for instance, in the Violence Against Children and Youth Surveys and other data coming out of the Caribbean, homicides are actually one of the biggest forms of violence against children, kind of the ultimate form of violence. You know, there are countries in the Caribbean and Latin America where homicides are like the second biggest source of death or source of fatalities among kids 10 to 13. I mean, really young kids. Violent conflict, a lot of that is happening uh, in the Middle East. Um, school violence, the United States has one of the highest levels of school violence in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, by that you know, we get that we earn that title because of the gun violence in our mm -hmm. schools. There are other countries in which sexual violence in schools is a much more serious problem. But that's what these violence against children and youth surveys will actually tell us. In some countries, we find for school violence, the corporal punishment in school is meted out more to boys than girls. And then for girls, it's sexual violence that they meet in school. So it varies a lot among countries, but unfortunately there are patterns. So how do we raise awareness for violence against children and what are the barriers to a solution? I think the barriers to a solution are some of the things I, I mentioned before. You know, this is something that can't be dealt with, that it's too complicated, that what happens in somebody else's family should stay in that family, that this is people's culture and we can't, uh, you know, we can't impact on other people's culture. So that's part of the problem. But I think we're breaking through that, just being really clear that what happens to anybody's children is everybody's problem in a society. Um, and I think that message is getting through in a number of different ways. So we need to make sure that in all countries that there are um, that there is knowledge and implementation of the INSPIRE strategies, that all countries, whether they do a violence against children survey um, or whether they do some other kind of study, that they understand where the violence is coming from against children. In some countries, it will be a lot of it will be coming from um, the internet. But the point is that we have ways of gathering the data that will tell us the scale of the problem, will make clear its devastating impacts, will tell us the kind of strategies that might work, and will let us know how to generate the national data that can be transformed into action plans that will make a difference for kids. And on a more personal level, we might think, well, I don't commit violence against children myself, or I don't really interact with kids very often. So maybe this isn't relevant to me, but whose responsibility is this? And I guess I hope that listeners will understand that it's everybody's problem. Mm -hmm. Because victims of violence and children who witness violence have a range of problems going forward. And those problems will not be the problems of their own family. Those problems 
will be the responsibility of the public health systems, the public education systems, the taxpayers in the countries in which they live. So quite apart from the moral and ethical issues around violence against children, you know, we say, why, why should we care about stopping violence against children? Because children are human beings and they're the future of every society. That's why we should care. But if we want to get into self-interest arguments, we should care because either you prevent the violence against children when they're young, or you will have to take care of the consequences as they grow older. How can we be part of the solution? I think there's various ways. It depends if people are interested in doing something locally. You know, there are a number of ways, usually at the local level, that people can be involved. We have some resources. I know that I provided some resources to you, Laura, to let people be in touch with organizations more on the national and global level if they're interested in learning more about the problem or would like somehow to get involved. Even going to local hospitals or the local civil society organizations or just keeping your eyes open for children in your community that are trying in their own way to reach out and to let others know that something is wrong, that they don't feel safe at home, or they don't feel safe in their school, or they don't feel safe in some part of their community, which they may not be able to avoid. Many people miss the signals because they're not looking for them. So those resources to prevent violence against children are keep-kids-safe.org, keepingchildrensafe.global, end-violence.org, and bravemovement.org. I'll also share those links in the description below. Now, Kathleen, what is the final message that you want to leave our listeners with? Perhaps four key messages, which is that violence against children happens everywhere in families rich and poor and in countries rich and poor. And it's one of the biggest public health problems of our time. Secondly, We know what to do. There are evidence-based strategies to prevent and to end violence against children. Thirdly, we know how to gather the data that will tell us where children are unsafe and who is harming them. And then we can apply those strategies in a very specific and effective way. And fourthly, to take responsibility, to look at children as the future of every society And whether they're your children or somebody else's, they need to be protected, they need to be cherished, and they have the right to be able to fulfill their full potential. And once again, those links and resources to help prevent violence against children are in the description. Thanks again, Kathleen, for being a guest. And thanks for listening to Making Public Health Personal, presented by the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy in New York City. You can now share, like, and subscribe to our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, and on our YouTube channel. To find out more about our school, you can visit sph.cuny.edu or connect with us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search CUNY SPH. This is your host, Laura Mioli Farragon, signing off. And while public health has a global impact, that doesn't mean we can't make it personal. (laughs) 